my current boyfriend and I, we began dating in 2015 and we moved in together into a new house about a year after that. We had just graduated from college, got our first real job, and therefore budget for rent was tight to say the least. The house that we ended up renting was an old Victorian style property. I believe it is nearly 100 years old and the age really shows when you go inside the house. I didn't like the property from the get-go, it wasn't the age of the house that bothered me the most. In fact, I didn't mind that at all as long as the rent was affordable, which it was. The only thing was though, and this may sound a little stupid, but I just didn't have a good feeling about the property. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right being in there. But in any event, Ron insisted that we should rent the house because we weren't going to get anything better at that price range. He was right too and I couldn't continue insisting on moving elsewhere on feelings alone. As you might have guessed, we ended up taking the place. The first day, as it is on any moving day, things were hectic and we were so fatigued like you wouldn't believe it. By nighttime, we unpacked what we could, put together the bed, and I let Ron take a shower first. I went into the shower after Ron was done. I was enjoying the hot water running down from my head to toe when I felt something rubbing on my back. For a second there, I thought it was Ron having his fun. But when I turned around to see his arm poking in through the shower curtain, I found myself to be alone in the shower. It was really peculiar because I swear I felt a hand. Creeped out, I quickly finished the shower and stepped out of the bathroom. Then I was walking toward our bedroom when something slapped the hair in the back of my head and I could hear the droplets of water hitting the wall. I stopped, touched my hair, and looked around. Sure enough, I could see the slightly dampened spots on the wall. I stood in the hallway trying to figure out what I might have bumped into, but it didn't take long for me to realize that I hadn't bumped into anything. Creeped out even more, I went into the bedroom, got under the blanket, and borrowed a tiny space to squeeze into in between Ron's arms. I felt safe in there and had a good night's sleep. The next day, Ron stepped out first because it takes half an hour longer for him to get to his place of work. I thought about stepping out with him, but then it didn't feel right that I felt unsafe in my own home. I decided to tough it out and tried to get used to being alone in the house. That was a big mistake. Not long after Ron had stepped out, I began hearing footsteps coming from the smaller bedroom that we decided to use as an office. Thump, thump. The footsteps were heavy with presence. That was more than enough scare for me to run out of the house and seek shelter in my car. I went to work and once in the office, I decided to do a little experiment. Nothing happened in the office but then I was with other people. It made sense to me at the time that I should go to the restroom, stay there alone to see if I would still feel or hear things. In the restroom, I locked myself in one of the stalls and waited for another person to finish washing their hands and get out. After about a minute, I was alone. My heart was pumping at the speed of light and I was sweating like a pig even though I rarely sweat even on a really hot summer day. I waited in there for 10 minutes, but nothing happened. You might think that I might have been happy about that, but I really wasn't. I was hoping that it was all in my head and therefore that I would feel and hear things when I was left alone in the restroom. If that were the case, I just needed to grow a pair in a manner of speaking and try to get over the fear of the new house. However, as I had mentioned, nothing happened in the restroom. It wasn't a guarantee, but now it was more likely that strange things were truly happening in our new house. I went home after work and explained everything to Ron. Surprisingly, he wasn't dismissive, nor did he try to make light of the situation. Basically, he made it clear that he didn't believe in ghosts or spirits. However, he told me that he knew me well enough to know that I'm not someone to get spooked so easily. He believed something strange was happening to me in the new house, 
but just like me, he didn't know exactly what was causing those things. Weeks went by and in that time, I was relentlessly haunted by the presence in the house. Whatever it was, it was sneaky and devious. It would never touch me when Ron had direct sight of me. If it did, it would touch me from under the table and freak me out like that. If I had a boyfriend who wasn't as patient and open-minded as Ron, then you'd be sure I would have been dumped a dozen times over. But he stood by me and did what he could to protect me. Then one day, I was in the bedroom changing when Ron walked in. He looked at me and I saw his jaw fall to the floor. Maybe five seconds had passed by when Ron grabbed my hand and nearly threw me out of the room. Outside of the house, he explained to me that my hair was floating in the air, one pointing to the left and another to the right. They moved as though two invisible hands were making my hair dance. The movement was direct and purposeful. On top of that, when was the last time you saw a draft coming into a room, split your hairs into two, and pull them in separate directions? I know the answer to that. Never. Ron had finally witnessed what was happening to me for nearly two months, and it took me out of the house on that very day. He took me to a hotel and told me that he didn't care how much it would cost us to keep me out of the house. Every day, he brought me the things I needed and we stayed at the hotel for the next two months. We made a deal with the landlord to pay the rent until the house was rented out to new tenants. That took a month and a half, then it took us about two weeks to find a new place. The haunting stopped once we began sleeping in the hotel, and all was good at the new place we rented as well. I feel sorry to the new people who have moved into our old place, but personally, I can't tell you how happy I am that the spirit is bound to the house and not me. I wish I could warn people of that house, but I'm sure I'll be slapped with a lawsuit if I did that publicly. It took two months for my boyfriend, who by the way left with me, to see for himself what was truly happening to me in that house. I don't even want to imagine explaining, let alone proving a true haunting in a court of law. As bad as I feel for not warning others of that house, a lawsuit is another nightmare that I refuse to get involved in. I'm sure the landlord knows exactly what's happening in his house. I mean, how could he not when his tenants are constantly moving out? I pray to God that he will rot in hell one day for all the mines he scarred for his rent money. The man deserved to burn in hell. I was in bed one night completely asleep when I was awoken by the sensation of something prodding on my feet. Half awake, I tell Amanda, my girlfriend who's sleeping right next to me, to cut it out. I try to go back to sleep, but then she does it again. I rub my eyes, sit upright, and the plan is to slap her foot, but then I see a young girl standing at the foot of my bed. I utter in confusion and dismay, what in the hell? I'm a little spooked, but at the same time, I feel bad. You see, it may be a ghost that I'm seeing, but it's still a little girl, and she looks really sad. So I changed my tune and asked the young one, Hey, how did you get in here? But she says nothing back. Then I go, Listen, it doesn't matter. Tell me where you live and I'll take you home. Still nothing. Okay, can you tell me the phone numbers of your parents or your home, maybe? The young girl still says nothing, and so I shake the leg of my girlfriend to wake her up, but she doesn't respond at all. That's when the young girl grabs my hand and gently pulls on it as if she wants me to follow her. I get up and the young girl leads me toward the bedroom door, then points on the doorknob so I would open the door. We go past the kitchen, the living room, and finally arrive at the front door. The young girl once again points at the doorknob and so I proceed to open the door. Once outside, we walk two blocks toward the cul-de-sac, then finally stop in front of a two-story house. Then suddenly, she lets go of my hand, runs toward the door, then disappears right through it. Yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it. It didn't look as though her body just evaporated into thin air, but rather more like she melted through the door. 
I stood there for a short while, but then soon realized how creepy I must look if someone was watching me at that very moment. I went back home and sat on my couch in shock of what I had just witnessed. I had a tiny bit of suspicion at first that I was either dreaming or seeing a ghost, but then as soon as the young girl grabbed my hand, that's when I was assured that she was just a child. While we were walking toward the two-story house, I didn't think for a second that I was holding hands with a spirit. But what else could it be? She's either a ghost or I must have lost my mind for 10 minutes or so when I was with the girl. Whatever the case may be, I fell asleep and woke up on the couch in the morning. The time was 7 and I had this incredible urge to retrace my steps from last night. I put on some clothes, then began walking toward the two-story house. I stopped in my tracks a block away from the house. There were two police cruisers and an ambulance in front of the house. I hesitated going forward at first, but at the same time, I desperately wanted to find out what was happening. I walked toward the scene and there were a few neighbors out on the street talking to one another. I asked one of the ladies, Hi, uh, what happened? The lady responds, I think the Livingstone's daughter passed away last night. I didn't see it, but one of our neighbors says she saw her body being carried out into the ambulance. Oh my god, it's just so terrible. I turned around and walked away in complete shock. I remember calling in sick to work that day and staying in bed the entire morning and afternoon. The trauma from the experience actually made me sick, I mean physically ill. I was able to get up and walk around in the evening, but mentally I was completely drained. It took me a good part of the month to fully recover from the experience and I'm okay today. I think it took me that long to feel mentally balanced again because I could speak to no one about what I had experienced. I didn't know I would feel like this at first, but as I write down the story, it feels good and it sort of gives me closure to the whole thing. You know, wherever the young girl might have gone to, I truly hope she is in a better place. The time was close to midnight and I was driving home after work. I had just merged onto a parkway and as the time would suggest, the road was void of cars. I was really tired after a long day at the restaurant, but unfortunately for me, I had another 20 minutes of drive on the parkway before I could go home and get some much needed rest. 5 minutes in on the parkway, a tail light of a car appears out of nowhere so I slam on the brakes as I swerve onto the shoulder. I'm at a full stop on the side of the road and it feels like my heart's pumping a thousand times a second. The other car still parked on the right lane of the parkway and it isn't moving at all. I think for a second if I should go check on the driver or if it would be better to call the police. Truthfully, I much prefer leaving the job to the cops but it's just too dangerous to leave a car parked in the middle of the road. I get out of my car and walk toward the parked vehicle. Before I could walk up to the driver, I hear the tires screeching and the car speeds off, giving me another near heart attack. I'm standing there totally dumbfounded when I realize that I'm standing in the middle of a road. I quickly get back to my car and give myself a minute to collect my thoughts. Before I saw the parked car, my eyes were fully fixated on the road. I was tired but I wasn't nodding off or losing my concentration. There was no way that I could have missed the taillight of a car before coming that close to a collision. And yet, that's exactly what happened. A few more yards and I would have hit that car. How does that happen? Regardless, I have to go home and so I get back on the road. I drive for another mile when a car approaches from behind at a high rate of speed. The car has its high beam on and I'm now driving half blind. I proceed to merge onto the left lane and give the high beam car a clear path to pass me. The only problem is, it doesn't. Instead, it follows me onto the left lane and it continues to match my speed. This is not a normal behavior and I'm really scared. 
I try to clear the path once more, and so I merge onto the right lane. That's when the car tries to ram my car from the side, and I instinctively swerve toward the shoulder as I hit the brake as hard as I possibly can. My car comes to a stop, then I look to the side, front and back, but the other car's nowhere to be seen. It's gone just like that. Think about it for a second. I was driving on a parkway and there were no intersections anywhere. On that road, you either go forward or backward if you have a death wish I suppose. The point is, the high beam car had no place to take a turn or hide for that matter. When I came to a stop, I should have seen it either speeding away or at a stop near my car. But no, it just disappeared. The rest of the drive was all normal and I've never experienced anything remotely similar since then. I hesitate to say what I think it was, but please don't tell me that it was all in my head. I don't get scared easily, I don't have wild imaginations, nor am I crazy. I've heard of a story way back about a man who died on that road in a car accident while driving intoxicated. I didn't make the connection at first, but ever since that story came back to my mind, I can't stop thinking that I might have seen the ghost of that drunk driver. I really don't know, but I just had to share this story to someone because it's been boggling my mind for so long. Whatever it was, I just hope I never see it again. But better than that, I should really move as soon as I can. Hey guys, Dennis here. I haven't left or quit YouTube. It's just that life happened and I couldn't make any videos. Long story short, my company, or rather the company that I work for, has gone through a merger recently. Well, it's actually more, more like a takeover, but yeah, anyways, merger. I sort of got a promotion in the process, but it's not really a promotion because it's more like that I got the position by default during the merger process. But anywho, there were some added responsibilities on my end working the new position and I was on the road for better part of the month. I got a new laptop, a really powerful one to edit videos on the road, but there was no way for me to record the narration without some serious degradation in audio quality. So yeah, it was impossible for me to make new videos for you guys. You know, you gotta pay the bills to keep the lights on and all that. With that said, I'm back to working my normal schedule and doing my regular routine, so obviously I'll be posting more often. Just wanted to fill you guys in on why I haven't been around for so long and now you know why. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Goodbye for now.